Tim and his wife, uh, as they are traveling and such. Okay. Oh, we have visitors today. Earl and Rosaline Forsman. Roslyn. Okay. Welcome. Good to see you. Good to have you today. This is a good day to be in Sunday school. Okay. Welcome. God, it's good to see you. And like I say, buddy, it's not here. Tim is not here today. So you've got the leftovers. <laughs> well, I got told my wife this morning, this is not my first rodeo. So. Okay. All righty. Let me see. You know, see these things? You pick them up on the way over into church in the foyer, okay? So I'm not going to spend a lot of time going over this because I am sure you remember your first grade teacher in your second grade, they taught you to read like me. Uh, I got bad eyes, but you know. So please take care and read this thing. The things that we want to remember, uh, the beach party, the friendship class party, January the 13th at 1130 in the Fellowship Hall. Okay? Sunday's the last Sunday to get tickets. Sunday's the last Sunday to get tickets. Now, you have an announcement, Pam? Uh, very quick. The, the tournaments that are in the chairs, these are still foster children, Florida foster children um, that we helped with the pajamas and the socks. And so we're, we're being asked to please take these children and, and pray for them for, at Christmas time. There are so many. You've taken some of the names, but there's still, we had so many, so we put them on the chairs. They're not reserving the chairs. So, uh, please grab one and be praying for them. Yeah, we were looking for a place to sit this morning and every place had a tag on it. <laughs> so we found out. It's good. It's so good. Praise the Lord. It's so good. What we want to do, we have a nice, beautiful couple that are going to come up and give their testimony this morning. Richard and... Come on up. <laughs> Kelly. Richard and Kelly. Okay. And I'll be sitting right over there. Okay. <laughs> I'm not quite as bad as Tim, but pretty close. <laughs> Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas! Well, mine's short and sweet, but I was born in Boulder City, Nevada. It's about 10 miles and a world away from Las Vegas. It's the home of Hoover Dam, where my dad worked for 30 years. Um, my sister is 13 years older than me, so we didn't have much of a relationship until much later in life, like now. Um, she and her husband followed us from Reno, and they're living here in Ocala. Um, so we're working on our relationship and being sisters. Um, my parents were very active in our little Southern Baptist Church in Boulder City and later in Las Vegas. My mom taught preschool, Sunday school for 40 years, 
and participated in all the women's ministries. And my dad was a Sunday school teacher, a superintendent, deacon, part-time janitor, lawn maintenance, handyman, and he even preached on occasions. Um, I was saved uh, during a revival when I was nine years old. My family hosted a dinner for the evangelist and pastor one night, and I accepted Jesus into my heart that evening. I had been an active choir member since high school, and I've sung solos and been on praise team over the years. After I graduated high school, I joined the Navy. Yay. I spent six years in the service. Uh, I was stationed in Sugar Grove, West Virginia for my first duty station. Sugar Grove, West Virginia. What's the world? In the Navy. <laughs> it's the Mountaineer Navy. Um, I was privileged to be part of starting a church there in Brandywine, West Virginia. Um, after the Navy, I got married, and I drifted away from my relationship with the Lord. It was an abusive marriage, so uh, it only lasted about five years. I worked for the Nevada Highway Patrol in my dream job as a dispatcher for 16 years. In that time, I met my second husband. <laughs> we were both newly divorced, and a friend of ours in the church suggested that we have coffee sometime since we had so much in common. <laughs> the difference was that he had four children already from a previous marriage. <laughs> the youngest was three when I met them. Uh, about eight months after we met, we were married in the church where we met, and suddenly we were a family of six. We had two parrots and two dogs. And then if that wasn't enough, a fifth child came along a couple years later. <laughs> so we were definitely the Brady Bunch. <laughs> so to spend more time with my family, I changed careers, and I went into the administrative side of the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. I spent 21 wonderful years going through the ranks and promoting to an administrative assistant, through the department, moving through the department at various bureaus, with the last being at the forensic lab where I spent seven years. I retired in October of 2022, and as recent empty nesters, Rich and I decided we'd had enough of the Las Vegas heat and the drought and made the move across country. We felt God was really in this move because he saw us through the move, buying a house pretty much unseen and placing wonderful Christian neighbors right next door to us that invited us to this church. So we felt at home here ever since. Two and a half minutes. Yeah, I Usually you tell me I talk too much, but probably. I was uh, born and raised in Los Angeles. I'm 73 years old. My, um, my, bro my parents and my brother, who was a doctor, they've all passed on. So um, I graduated college in uh, the Valley just outside of uh, Los Angeles. Uh, I started a cabinet company um, way back when, in 73, and it's still going today. And we brought it out with us, which was a big chore to put all that into a movie van, because <laughs> a lot of machines. <laughs> but God's been with me. I've had numerous occasions where I've had major accidents and one instance um, I had a heart attack in 2004 and they got me into the uh, emergency room my heart stopped in front of the doctor and uh, he said I had five minutes so God was with me for sure so and there's been other instances similar and I think God wanted me to stick around because he knew I had four kids. <laughs> well, that, <laughs> that, that was your idea. <laughs> 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 we have coffee, we have right? And she says, well, you're through having kids, right? I said, I thought so. And she says, well, how about one more? And I said, you better do it quick because it's going to be raised on Medicare. <laughs> and it is, it was. <laughs> so... Yeah, it was something else. So in 1981, uh, I moved out of L.A. and moved to Vegas. And I was up there for 32 years. And um, 90 days of 120 degree weather was just getting to kill us. As we got older, we couldn't handle it. You know, you can't go out. 
So, and, um, you know, it's, it's um, yeah, it was, but yeah, we had our fifth child. I have, I have four girls and one boy. <laughs> and the boy is in the middle and he's totally henpecked. <laughs> the girls knew how to push his buttons. <laughs> but they're all Christians. They are. When, when my marriage fell apart, the first, the first, the mother of the children, the first four, she just came home one night and said, I really don't want you and I don't need the kids. I'm gone. Bye. <laughs> and they were two to 12. And I about had a heart attack there, yeah. you know, because I didn't, I didn't book that job of raising mm -hmm. four little kids mm -hmm. by myself. But, you know, the Lord gave me the kids. I stuck by them. And I was very adamant about raising them the right way. Mm -hmm. So when I, I told them, I said, we're going to church, what's left of us? And they said, no, nah, Dad, you go and you come back and we'll see you after church. I said, no, now you can't keep them out of church. <laughs> they all... You know, they follow the Lord really good. I have 13 grandkids. Oh. It breaks my bank. Well, you're very blessed. Yeah, I yeah, am, and they're all good kids. No drugs, no booze, you know, none of that stuff. And they know the Lord, and they know I'll get them. So. But they're not here. They're all over the country. So... That's the only thing. And then we moved here. We moved here because a friend of mine became a realtor. And he's in Orlando, and he became a realtor. And he said, why don't you look at Ocala? Because we were looking in Alabama because the beaches were so pretty and the water. She's a beach fiend. And he said, look at Ocala. Well, we found one. We have a house that's on almost an acre. And it has a huge building on it for my shop. So uh, it was perfect for me. And now I get a lot of work at the villages. Angie's List refers me a ton of work. So I still keep working. Praise the Lord. Yeah, you know, Social Security and her retirement are good, but not quite good enough. <laughs> so then my neighbor... My neighbor is 80 years old, and he says, uh, are you looking for a church? I said, yeah, and he goes, well, what, what denomination are you? I said, Baptist. He goes, perfect. <laughs> he gives me the card. And so she's uh, heavy, and she's, she's on the board, and it's a lovely family. But that's my life, so here I am. <laughs> Bless you. You know, these testimonies, uh, I've, we've been hearing these testimonies for those who have been here for quite a while, and I am amazed at the histories of you folks. I mean, I, we have missionaries here, we have woodworkers here, we have people of all sorts of things military, retired military, you know, you name it, it's here. And it's just amazing. So if you need something done, cadet-wise, there's the man. Okay, if you can get him. If you can get him. No, oh, it's good to be here. It's so good. Barbara, God bless you today. It's good to see you. Too. It's good to see you. Well, today is an interesting day. Um, we are... Um, our lesson today is going to be, it, it, it's interesting in many ways. It's a simple, very simple story. But it's also a story in Luke that has a lot of practical things in it. It's more practical than theological. And you know, when we get around to the time of uh, Christmas, I mean, there's all kinds of messages be preached on Jesus. I mean, on and on and on and on. But today's lesson is interesting that they picked this particular topic. And I think the reason they did is because this is where we live. We live in the practical day. 
right? We live in this class, in our age, we live with a lot of aches and pains. We live with, you name it, we live with it. All you got to do is look at that prayer list that Greg sends out every week, and you'll see all kinds of interesting things. And then last night they had what over in um, Paddock Mall, they had a shooting. Uh, one person was, I think, killed, one was wounded. Yeah. Yeah. I first got one and said 15. I thought, I don't believe that, but... But later on, it came back with the two numbers. So we live in a very practical world. And think about this. God is a very practical God. And hopefully in this lesson today, we're going to see a little bit of this practicality of what it means to live just in the world. Now, back in the day when uh, Mary and Joseph, of course, was living, it was a different world, a different society, uh, different rules and regulations and uh, just a number of things that are different but there are a lot of things that aren't different you know how to make a living do am I going to have enough money how am I going to do this or this or this we face the same issues that really anybody else in the world whether you live in Japan whether you live in Australia whether you live in the European Union somewhere we really face all the same issues, and that's the reason the gospel is so effective. It speaks to all these issues that are so important. So today, as we move forward in this, um, we want to come to this topic of the first Christmas. Now, I looked around, and somebody took the map down. And I wanted to use that today, but, so you're going to have to use your imagination. How many of you have had the opportunity and the blessing of going and visiting Israel? Some of you. Okay, good. Okay. And before I visited Israel, there was, it was kind of imaginary things. And after I got over there and saw everything, it really changed a lot of the things in my thinking. So as we do this, I want to kind of um, take you on this trip back over there. Um, and I like to begin by saying, uh, thinking back over the years, do you remember some of your Christmas memories? I do. I remember when my dad and mom got us, uh, my brother and I, these big boxes, and they had guns and things in them, you know, soldier stuff. And my brother was out looking around, we trying to find what daddy got us, and we looked up in the attic and we saw the boxes. <laughs> we ran away from that, and we never said a word. <laughs> but uh, little things like that you remember and uh, you remember some gifts gifts that were special or maybe you remember the tree and decorations and some of you could really decorate your house well today we will take a look at the first Christmas with that let's see God's intended purpose and events of that special time we call the first Christmas and we're going to do this out of Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 15, okay? Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 15. I've stuck pretty close to the lesson plan on this because it's so simple. And that's what we want to get to today, the simplicity of life. How much Jesus loves us. How much we love him. How is he involved in my daily activity? What's his relationship to me? And more importantly, what's my relationship to him? These are very, very important, simple concepts that we need to think about. We read and uh, understand God's authority seen in his offer of eternal life through his son, Jesus Christ. And we've got to remember through this very, very few verses that describe this in Luke, that it's amazing how God will move heaven and earth to accomplish his plan. Now, we can see it back in Luke how he did that. All you got to do is bring that forward and think in terms of how God is moving in the world today. The world thinks it's got the, these leaders think they've got the bull by the tail. No, they have a lion by the tail. And he's got old big teeth. So, we're going to see how God moves 
Now, kind of an introductory note here. Not all biblical firsts are found in Genesis 1.1. You know, such as in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. At the beginning, if you like baseball. Now, as an example today, we focus on the first that serves as the pinnacle event for every other first incredible important date circled on God's calendar of redemption. And remember, we're talking about God's plan of redemption. Remember back in Genesis chapter 3, when Eve did her thing and Adam did her thing and they passed the buck around to the snake and all that, you know. Yeah. And God says, well, there's going to be someone who comes and crushes your head, Satan. That's the first that we heard of, of about the coming of Jesus Christ and the redemption that he's promised. But today's study examines the birth of Jesus, the long-awaited Messiah and God in flesh and blood. This was something that the Jews were waiting for. Now, the child born in Bethlehem was, I would say, the centerpiece in God's plan. To, now, this is important. To remove the sin barrier that had been erected in the Garden of Eden. Remember, God said, you sin, you're going to die. Is there any exception to this today? We all die. Man, sometimes in our Sunday school class, I prayed that we got that I hope everybody's there. Because sometimes you walk in and somebody ain't there no more. You know? And so we all are going to die. The question is, is what's going to be our where's going to be our forwarding address? There's only two. You have Jesus, it's going to be heaven. If you don't have Jesus, it's going to be a place where there's no windows. It's going to be hot. Now, a key element here is how God took the initiative to restore his relationship with humanity. You know, God took the initiative, did we? No. Nope. He came to earth for all of us, and all through the Bible we see God always reaching for man with no real response from man. man. You know, uh, when I was teaching mission courses, uh, mission courses start with Genesis chapter 3. You know, how God came to us. Did we ever go to God? No. God always comes to us. God always comes to us and offers us the grace of salvation. And that decision... Because of this wonderful free will he gave us, lies within us. And if we reject that and walk away from that and continue rejecting that, the Holy Spirit doesn't call us as much anymore. So when we hear that call of salvation, man, you better answer that. You better take it up right away. Don't waste time. Now, look... Uh, Luke began, uh, <coughs> Luke began his gospel by placing the events surrounding the births of John the Baptist and Jesus during the reign of Herod the Great. And before I go on, I want to pray. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you this day, Father, for this Christmas celebration. We thank you for sending Jesus into the world. Thank you, Father, for sending this uh, book of Luke to us. It's 66 books that tells us how we can know you and who we are and what we need in life. Thank you, Father. And I pray this, these words, this lesson would be a tremendous, tremendous blessing to all of us here today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, in that day too, we see Herod ruled as king. And that's 40 B.C. to about 4 B.C. Okay, it's... 40 years before Christ and four years after, uh, four years before Christ. Next in chapter 2, Luke mentions Caesar Augustus, emperor of Rome. Now, Augustus' reign stretched from 31 B.C. to A.D. 14. Why am I saying this? I'll get to that in a minute. 
The next mile marker is the dating of these events was uh, Cornelius, the governor of Syria, who eventually was in office on two different occasions from 5 B.C. to 4 B.C. And again from 6 A.D. to 9 A.D. Each of these men are known to history and fit into the timeline su suggested by Luke. Now, what's important? about this. Why are these things important? The historical dating and validation within Luke's gospel are his reference to a first registration to census. Scholars point to two different censuses associated with Cornus while he was governor and Luke indicated that, uh, that this Christmas narrative occurred during the first census of Quirinius, which affirms the widely accepted belief that Jesus was probably born between 6 and 4 B.C. You know, some people argue about whether or not uh, the <coughs> Jesus was really who he was. Was he really born? I mean, that's the world. And let me tell you, there's more evidence that Jesus was born and lived and ministered and died and rose than any other person alive today Amen. or alive sure. in that day. Even famous people, Aristotle and people <coughs> like that, there's more proof that Jesus was here and he did what he said he was going to do. So if anybody ever tries to argue with that, you can say, well, I have a lot of evidence. Jesus is here. You know why he's here? Because he talked to me today. And I've talked to him today. That's a great testimony. Let's go on. Oh. You know, I'm not like Tim. Tim can start this and end it right. I'm a clock watcher. And, now, and let's look at Luke chapter 2, one, verses 1 through 5. Now, in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the whole empire should be registered. This first registration took place when Cornus, Cornus was governor of Syria. So everyone went to be registered, each to his own town. Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family line of David to be registered along with Mary who was engaged to him engaged and was pregnant what did Mary get worried that's something what went on in that little town <laughs> verse 1 and 2 with all the ladies and the men Oh, ladies, I'm not going to get in trouble with you. Today. <laughs> in trouble with the ladies today. Yeah. Now, in those days, a decree, now verse 1 and 2, in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the whole empire should be registered. The first registra registration took place while Cornelius was governor of Syria. Now, this was a registration or census designed for taxation. You can identify with that. You're right? Just don't pay your taxes. I mean, you don't have to register. They know you already. Now, each male was to report to each male. Hmm, ladies didn't have to pay taxes. Ooh, that saved a lot of money. <laughs> Maybe. Um, each male was to report to his ancestral home and have his name, occupation, property and family members listed in a public register. They didn't have computers in those days, so you had to go and have it done yourself. No. Now in verse 2, Luke noted that this was the first registration that occurred, the first, this helps in dating, during the term of Cornelius as governor of Syria. A second registration mentioned in Acts 5.37 most likely took place in AD 6, which was well after the birth of Jesus. And periodic reg registrations were common in the Roman world. They wanted to be sure they got their tax. Remember, who was Matthew? 
Ah, yeah. Was it they loved by the Jews? No. Oh, no. They worked for the Romans. Oh, yeah. They, they were wealthy. They took their part and their part and your part and everybody's part. So in verse 3 we read, So everyone went to be registered, each to his own town. Now, why was it necessary for Joseph to go to Bethlehem? Now, this is where I need to map. Where's my little that marker, Jim? Over there in that tray. Oh, okay. Maybe I can do it like this. If you haven't been to Israel, this is kind of a coastal line of Israel. And uh, over here would be the Galilee, Sea of Galilee, and you have the river, Jordan River. And down here you have the Dead Sea right there. And uh, so a little further up. So up here is Nazareth. Okay? That's Nazareth. Okay? Nazareth is not on a flat place. Nazareth is on a hill about like that steep. Okay? Anywhere you go in Israel, almost, except the big valley, you're going uphill or downhill. Uphill, you go to Jerusalem, you're going uphill and downhill. It's all hills. You read the Bible says, they went up to Jerusalem. Yeah, well, Jerusalem's on top of the mountain. Everybody went up to Jerusalem, no matter where you were. Now, Nazareth was up here. Um, right in here. Uh, I got the wrong place. That's in the ocean. Now, that's, right that's on the side of a mountain. Now, Jerusalem is somewhere about right here. That's Jerusalem. And then about five miles down the road, you see Bethlehem. Okay? Now, they're going to take this trip. There's three ways they could take it. They could go down the mountain, down near the coast, and along the coast. And then go back up to Jerusalem and over to Bethlehem. That was one way. Now, 90 miles. Ladies, eight months pregnant, walking 90 miles. Now you know why they, she had the baby. <laughs> <laughs> then there's another way to go. You can go over to the Sea of Galilee, down along the Jordan River, and up to Jerusalem, by Jerusalem, and down into Bethlehem. You could go that way. The other way, the third way, you could went down and kind of up into Samaria and down this way and down into Bethlehem. Three different ways you could go. And no matter where you go, you're going to go up and down. Well, the easiest way would be going down to the Sea of Galilee along the Jordan Valley, and you had this big climb up to Jerusalem and down to Bethlehem. Now, I drove that in a car. That is a steep mountain. And going up to Nazareth is a steep mountain. Now I know why Jesus stayed in Capernaum. It was all flat. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's this, uh, up and down, up and down, up and down. And it's a lot of rocks. You know, you read the scriptures about somebody getting stoned. They didn't have to go look for rocks. There are rocks all over the place. Okay. Okay. All right, now I got to move on. I wasted a lot of my time. Hey, Don. Yes, sir. Uh, interesting note that Clinton gave Bethlehem to the Arabs uh, when he was president. That, uh, he gave this, the city to the Arabs. It's well, it's like any world leader. They can give it to who they want to, right, Greg? Yeah, well, what's God going to do? Yeah, God, God says from the ocean to the rivers, God, God says that. Amen. Why was it necessary for Joseph to go to Bethlehem? Well, two possible reasons have been proposed. I'm not going to go through that because I don't like the way some of the things they said about it. They had to go to Bethlehem because that's where God said they had to go. You go down to the town of your what? Ancestors. That was plain. Now, more likely, explanation is that Jewish custom called for people <coughs> to return to their ancestral home for such a registration. The Roman government would have made concessions for allowing the, this custom to be followed, to, to, to travel. And the registration would have been carried out under the administration of, that's where Herod the Great, this, the king comes in. He, 
kind of make decisions about this stuff. And um, over and so as a, no, a nominal Jew, Herod would have required these trips. He said, go down there and take care of the thing. He, <coughs> he was under Rome as well. Yeah. Verse 4, Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David, which is called <coughs> Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family line of David. Just what I said, verse 4. Now, a little bit about this town of Bethlehem. Why am I sharing this this morning? This is basic stuff that we need in our repertoire when we sit down in a circle and somebody hands a little sheet out and has questions on it about the Bible. Okay? Or if you've got to make one up, here's some good things you can put in it. The town of Bethlehem's, the, uh, town of Bethlehem's original name was Ephraim. And you can see that in Genesis chapter 35, verse 19. And its name means what? House of bread. That's right. Yeah, okay. That's one question you can put on it. Okay. In the Old Testament, Jerusalem was known as the what? The city of David. But Luke identified Bethlehem with the title because it was the birthplace of King David. That's where David was born, Bethlehem. You can read that in Ruth chapter 1, verse 19, verse chapter 4, verse 13, 17, or 1 Samuel 16. Bethlehem was located about five miles south of Jerusalem. So think about that. Not in a car, by foot. How many miles, how fast can you walk? I used to could walk four miles an hour. Not now. <laughs> I can't even get a mile down the road. Now, in verse 5, it says, to be registered along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was pregnant. Now, one additional question discussed by scholars was, why Joseph took Mary with him to Bethlehem for the red? Why was it necessary to take her? Some evidence exists that suggests women were also subject to taxation, which I don't think that's true not just the head of the household. A second potential uh, reason was Joseph's attempt to protect Mary, Mary by taking her away from the gossip and speculation of Nazareth. Man, if I was engaged to a lady and she was going through that, and nobody believed that the Holy Spirit made her pregnant, can you imagine what a horrible place to live in? Imagine going out and getting water buying food. I think that had a lot to do with why he took her. Besides, God said that's the way it's going to be. <laughs> However, while the, it's amazing how God moves, he can lay things on our hearts. However, while thing, these explanations are possible, many scholars support a third option. Since Mary was Mary's due date and the deadline for the registration aligned so closely Joseph did not want to leave her alone at such a critical time. However, no matter, Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea. Judea. See how God is, God can move in the hearts of people? I mean, Joseph didn't know what to do when he heard she was pregnant. God informed him. And God led Joseph and Mary through this. They depended on him, although they probably didn't understand it all. They were depending on him, and he led them Oftentimes, in the practical things of life, just leave it lay. Just leave it alone. Just don't think about it. And let God do his thing. He's absolutely capable, <coughs> is he not? <coughs> and when does God does say, Hey, Greg, I want you to do this or that. You just get up and you go do it. Right, Greg? Yes, sir. Amen. When God says go, you buy, get off your tuff, get off that couch, and do what you've got to do. And when God says he wants you to do something, you better just go and do it. Okay? And if you're really a Christian today, and you walk with Jesus, and he walks with you, you know what I'm talking about. Right? Mm -hmm. Amen. And I'm
I'm going to run out of time before I run out of notes. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, let's go down to the birth. I wanted to say something about, the, before I move that on, about their move down from Nazareth to Bethlehem. So, this will ring with you, maybe, you guys. Joseph goes over and gets the donkey. All right? He has a donkey. Got that high. Goes and leads the donkey over to Mary's place. And here comes Mary and says, Okay, Joseph, go on. I got six suitcases in there. <laughs> <laughs> Drive them out and put them on that donkey. <laughs> <laughs> the donkey had a trailer. <laughs> we can add that into scripture, right? <laughs> so I thought about that because I remember how it was when we traveled. You know, there's always one more bag that wouldn't go where it's supposed to go. So Mary said, "Here's my five suitcases," and it's supposedly uh, Mary rode the donkey. I don't think so, because they had to carry food. They had there was no McDonald's. They had to carry clothing. She had to have pampers. <laughs> and she had to have the baby clothes. You know? And she had to have her makeup. <laughs> and all that stuff, right? Women don't go anywhere without their makeup. Some, some do, some don't. <laughs> this was some of the things that we face today that is kind of hilarious when you think about it. But let's go on to this birth. Now, while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. Ninety miles walking. At probably about two miles an hour, three miles an hour. Ninety miles. How many days it would take? That's a few days. Sleeping on the ground, you know, and so on and so forth. Eight months pregnant. Now, the typical picture of, picture of Jesus' birth gives the impression that Joseph and Mary had just arrived in Bethlehem, and that evening Jesus entered the world. That's the kind of story we get. Now, this author here has some interesting comments. Now, while that paints a beautiful picture, Luke's gospel gives no time reference other than it happened in Bethlehem in conjunction with the Roman registration. We have no knowledge of how long they had been in Bethlehem before his birth or whether it occurred before or after the registration. Note, after walking from Nazareth to Bethlehem, sure could have sped up that birth. Now, I would tend to think that the birth came very quickly because they're in, they are in that cave. The registration would have allowed people to, to register and leave and there would have been a place for them to stay. Well, later on it was, but... Here, they are in that cave, in that stable. And that was God's plan. Now, for Luke, the vital piece of information, information was the Messiah's birth in Bethlehem as predicted by the prophet. It all had to happen by the book, as it were. From details related to the wise men's visit, Matthew's Gospel indicates that the family stayed in Bethlehem for an extended time. They did. And they moved into a house, and he was working. Okay? Eight days later, they went up to the temple, and what? Jesus was circumcised. Right? And they stayed there until they were there. It must have been there a couple years, because that's what Herod used to kind of um, set up his order for the death of all the children in Bethlehem two years. No, he... The Bible says that they went up and dedicated Jesus, which had to be by the 40th day at Jerusalem, and immediately after that they went home to Nazareth. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate that correction, brother. I really do. Thank you. Now, verse 7, we move on this. Then she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him tightly in cloth and laid him in a manger, because there was no guest room available. Now, the words tightly in cloth refers to the long pieces of linen 
used to tightly wrap or swaddle an infant. This would have prevent unnecessary movement. You know, swallowing a baby is important, right? Mm -hmm. All you mothers are, what do you do? When a baby's born, they've been in your womb for what, nine months, mm -hmm. right? All kind of, when you when they're born, their legs, their arms are doing this, their legs are doing this, and they can't sleep. So you swaddle them so they can't move. And they sleep like a baby. <laughs> now, okay. Please remember the importance of this text. Christ is the eternal Son of God. In his, res in his incarnation, incarnation as Jesus Christ, he was conceived of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. We did read that in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, the Old Testament, and in the New Testament, Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 to 23. Now, not finding appropriate shelter, Joseph and Mary were forced to take shelter where they could, perhaps in the section of an old home where animals were kept. And that's, so that's where it ended up in the barn. Okay? And that's where the, uh, that's where the uh, uh, shepherds came and showed you. Okay? Uh, sir, if, uh, if, excuse what, me. what you just said, okay. Micah back, yep. back, chapter 5, mm -hmm. you back up to Micah chapter 4, verse 8, it tells you the very building he was born in, Megdal Ador, the Tower of the Flock, he was born in the ground floor birthing room where the sacrificial sheep were born. It's Thank in you, there, Chris. black and white. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate the addition. The Declaration in Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 15. Verses 8 through 15. Now, in the same region, shepherds were staying out in the fields and keeping watch at night over their flock. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the city of David, a Savior was born for you, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be the sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped tightly in cloth and lying in a manger. Suddenly there was a multitude of heavenly hosts with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to people he favors. When the angels had left them and returned to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's uh, go straight to Bethlehem and see what has happened, which the Lord was made, which was the Lord made known to us. And in verse 8, it's amazing. When God sent his son into the world you notice there was really no big fanfare no parades no big decorations the angels did not appear to the high priests and all the important people of that time he showed himself the angels showed themselves to the shepherds in the field why do you think maybe who, where did David come from? David was a he was a shepherd, right? What did Moses do in the back forty? Yeah, he for forty years he herded sheep. Abraham had sheep. They were shepherds. When uh, when uh, Jacob went down to uh, Egypt, they put them in a special place where they could raise their sheep because. Egyptians could not stand shepherds. So it's amazing to see God didn't come to the well-educated, well-informed. He came to simple shepherds. That's what kind of God he is. He comes to us simple people who know we need Jesus. Yeah. Let's go to verse 9. He says, Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. Uh, 
I've never seen an angel, I don't think. If we were to see an angel like that in his form, I think we would uh, probably run for a hiding place. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's amazing to see God speak to his people. And sometimes he would speak to people and look just like them. Yeah. Jesus appeared and he appeared like a person in his pre-incarnate form. It's amazing. Don't know what he looked like when he appeared in the garden, but doesn't say. We know what Daniel saw in Daniel's vision. It's amazing. Now, the word angel and angel of the Lord is the Greek word for messenger. Thus angels are heavenly messengers from God. Gabriel had delivered good news prior to the birth of both John in Luke 1, 9, and Jesus, Luke 1 through 26. This unidentified angel might also have been Gabriel because he also bore good news about the birth. Of, that was Gabriel's job, by the way. He was what? Christian, what was a Gabriel was a messenger, right? He was a messenger. He came to Mary, and, and uh, he was God's messenger. Okay? And he, I can't remember if there's any description of him anywhere, but I'll tell you one thing. Uh, pretty impressive. Can you wait to see him? We're going to see him. You know that? <coughs> we are going to see Gabriel when we get to heaven. It said, glory to the Lord suggests the weight and majesty of God's presence. God is present here. God is present. Okay. <laughs> oh, oh. <coughs> Finishing up, verse 10, but the angel said to them, don't be afraid. This is a wonderful thing about Jesus, isn't it? Jesus says, don't be afraid. Look, for look, I proclaim you good news of great joy. He told Mary. What did he tell Mary? Mary, it's okay. You're highly blessed. Okay. Don't be afraid. Yeah. That's God stepping in and saying, I got this. In your worst situation in life, God steps in and says, I got this. Now, today, verses 11 through 15, today in the city of David, a Savior was born for you who is the Messiah of the Lord. He will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped tightly in cloth and lying in a manger. Suddenly there was a multitude of the heavenly hosts with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to people in favor. Uh, he favors. When the angels had left them and returned to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go straight to Bethlehem and see what has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went. And they went. Now, in closing, I give you three important points. I'm not going to speak on these points. Three straight points, okay, because we're out of time. In closing, I give you three important points that you might want to remember. Number one, God demonstrates his authority in fulfilled prophecy. Number two, God demonstrates his authority through humble means and three God invites all people to witness his power have you received the free gift of salvation today today is the day of salvation just ask him to forgive you for your sins and come into your life and lead you from that point on the great message of Christmas is Jesus loves us and he came into this world and demonstrated that love to us by being born and growing up, dying on the cross and raising from the grave. Great. God bless you. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Hey, John. Yeah, one more thing. This is Peggy's last day. Huh? Oh. She's moving back closer to family. Oh. oh. We pray you have a safe trip. Thank you. Yes. Bless you on your new adventure. Yes. Baby. Thank you. Thank you. Gonna miss you.
Before you leave, Chris, how you doing, brother? Also, good to see you. Good to see you. My brother's name is Greg. Oh, yeah, okay. Good. Uh, would you be interested in having a Bible study? I don't know if you meet with any guys or anything. A Bible study? Uh, I can. Depends on where it is. I'm open. I'm retired. I, uh, yeah, sure. I'd be happy to. Uh, you know, me and maybe if, if we get anybody else. You know, maybe just, but, but for me to start, I've, I've been in situations. Yeah. A lot of different stuff. Okay. I've been, been missing. I'm give you a copy of study I did on the, the Magi and where, where Jesus was born and all that. Okay. And, and the Tower of the Flocks is all over there. 